This podcast discusses domestic violence, criminal behavior, murder, and adult themes. While not explicit, listener discretion is advised. Morning dawned on day two of the search for Susan Powell with more cold, icy weather over West Valley City, Utah. The storm that had painted the western U.S. white with snow the day prior was still pushing on to the east, the back edge just clearing the Rocky Mountains. Detective Ellis Maxwell hadn't slept much. West Valley's lead detective on the case had stayed up late the night before following his frustrating first interview with Susan's husband, Josh. Josh had returned from an unexpected winter camping trip with his sons, Charlie and Braden, on Monday afternoon, claiming to have no idea where Susan had gone. At about 8 on Tuesday morning, Ellis called Josh. He wanted to confirm Josh was planning to come in for a follow-up interview at 9 a.m. He also wanted to make sure the boys were not going to be there, as they'd been on Monday night. The kids were there, and it made it very challenging because he used that opportunity to avoid answering questions. And they were also a distraction as well. The phone rang and rang until it went to voicemail. Josh was dodging him. Not a promising start to the day. Next, Ellis called Josh's sister, Jennifer. She said she hadn't heard from her brother that morning. We were already on our way, but the weather was pretty bad and the roads were eh, pretty pretty scary and we were moving pretty slow and so there was no way we were going to make it by the time he needed to leave in order to be on time for that appointment either way but we said we would be as quick as we could and and we would be happy to take the kids while he went and dealt with that appointment and we were you know i was happy i don't know how my mother was feeling i'm sure that she was not happy about the situation at all in any way but I was happy that he was going in, that he had that appointment because I felt like, okay, now, now they're gonna get to the bottom of it. You know, they're gonna they're gonna figure out what's happened and maybe he'll he'll come clean. And and no matter what's happened, it, it's gonna be a crappy situation no matter what's happened. But if he comes clean, then we can at least move forward. This is Cold, Episode 5, 10 Minutes. I'm Dave Cauley. Josh had also got up early that Tuesday morning. Neighbors saw his minivan backed into the driveway at 8 a.m. He'd opened all the doors and was busy cleaning out the interior. Dax Guzman, one of those neighbors, had heard Susan was missing. He dropped by to check on Josh. I drove up. He was, he was getting in their van with the boys and I had stopped by and I just parked behind him. He asked me if I wanted to go inside and I feel kind of weird about the whole situation and maybe it's me being paranoid, but not anymore, but I I didn't go in. He, He asked me if I wanted to go into the house and felt kind of weird about it. Still do. Because that was the day after she disappeared. And, um, yeah, that was, that was strange. Now, by that point, Josh was already overdue for his police interview. When his sister Jennifer arrived, she learned he had had other priorities that morning. But we got there, and Josh wasn't even kind of close to being ready. Just ra- wandering around the the house, doing things he... You know, I kind of peeked out in the garage. He had he come out from the um, backyard into the garage with this big armful of looked like kind of wet rags and stuff. And um, he came in. He, I mean, he was doing lots of different. It looked like a lot of cleaning. And he put in a load of laundry. And he was like, "Why are you doing that? Your your wife is missing." And, you know, these aren't the things that people do when they're not guilty. Jennifer suspected Josh had done something horrible. She felt if she could just get her brother out the door and to the police station, 
the nightmare of the previous 24 hours might end. Shards of glass from the window the police had smashed still glittered on the living room carpet. Josh asked Jennifer to vacuum them up so the boys wouldn't cut themselves. You know, he's listing off a, you know, doesn't, and change the laundry, different things. He wants us to do all these things. And I don't feel comfortable with this. I really don't. But what am I supposed to say, you know, like, agree with anything he says at the moment, <laughs> first of all. Finally, finally he gets through and finishes his shower and leaves. And I just, I tell my mom, I don't like this situation. I don't think we should be cleaning anything. I, I think that this isn't right. And so she called the police and asked them about it. And what are they supposed to say? Don't touch anything. You know, I mean, like, they don't know where we're, where we're at with our, our loyalties, how much we're going to be doing to help him and try to cover up problems and, and things that he's done. They have no idea. So, of course, they're going to play it cool. And we didn't find this out until I can't remember exactly how much longer that before they show up. And my heart just sank. They show up at the door and I'm like, I knew it. I knew we shouldn't have been doing anything. But what can you do? Josh finally made it to the West Valley City Police headquarters just after noon, more than three hours late. A black knit cap sat on his head, tugged down low over his ears. He wore dirty white sneakers, denim pants, a t-shirt, and a black leather jacket. At a quarter to one, Josh and Ellis entered an interview room. Cameras were rolling. This is the actual recording. Now, on the, on the way over here, I actually did call my attorneys, and they should, said I should definitely have an attorney. What's that? I, I called my attorneys, which is prepaid legal. Okay. And they said that I should definitely have an attorney. If I didn't read you your Miranda rights, have I? That's what they said. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then, okay? This okay. is. Do you feel like you're under arrest? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even think it was that. I didn't. Didn't even sink in yesterday. But I don't know where she's at, and she ain't back yet. <laughs> Josh's behavior and body language were much different than they'd been on Monday night. He sniffled a lot. His voice wavered. He kept looking at the backs of his hands, which were dry and windburned. Ellis had taken pictures of Josh's hands the night before, documenting a few small nicks in his skin. The scrutiny seemed to really spook Josh. What are you worried about? What are you concerned about? You guys, you know, have implied some things, and so it, it concerns me. We've implied what? Well, you've implied that my hands have some kind of defensive wounds on them. Just okay. because they're all cut up, and that's just... It's just the way they are. Okay, so there shouldn't be anything you need to worry about then, right? You can see those pictures of Josh's hands at thecoldpodcast.com. Josh said he wanted to leave. Ellis wanted him to stay, but not if Josh planned to call a lawyer. If they request a lawyer, you're not going to get the answers you want. You're not going to get those direct answers. They're going to consult their attorney, or their attorney's going to tell them not to answer. And they're going to, it's just, it's, there's no, there's no win when you get a defense attorney that's going to answer questions for a suspect. They sparred for the better part of half an hour until Josh finally caved. Yeah, go ahead and ask the questions. Okay, you understand. You don't have to be here, all right? And you okay. need to understand that. If you want to leave, you can leave at any time. All right. You're not under arrest. I'm not detaining you, okay? Okay. If you don't want to be here, you can leave. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to talk. Well, I'm just I simply saying talk, that I want to find your wife. I just want to talk, but I'm getting scared. Okay. 
Well, I mean, if you haven't done nothing wrong, Josh, if you didn't do anything wrong, there's nothing to be scared about. Right? Well, I'm scared about the possibilities. Okay. Of what's happened. Well, I'm, I'm worried about possibilities of what happened, too. Because I have no idea where she's at, and you don't either. And that's why I need your help. All right. Yeah, go and ask the questions. A subtle shift occurred in Josh's demeanor. His posture relaxed. The sniffles disappeared. The tone of his voice flattened. Ellis settled in as well and started asking his questions. He probed Josh and Susan's background, when they married, why they came to Utah, their friends, their work histories, their finances, their daily routines. Josh took long pauses before speaking, only to then offer one or two word answers. Ellis would move on, then Josh would suddenly interrupt with some insignificant detail. At one point, he even bragged about how little he could spend feeding his family. It's also cheaper, and sometimes, because mm-hmm. we go to Del Taco yeah. on Tuesday, and we can eat our whole family for five bucks. Really? Wow. Four seventy. Ellis tried to keep the conversation on track. He asked about the weekend leading up to Susan's disappearance. Josh said on Saturday they'd gone to Home Depot and Lowe's with the boys for the free children's activities. Susan didn't usually attend these events because of her work schedule, but had taken the morning off for a church breakfast and decided to come along. Around noon, she left in the family's minivan, their only car, on her way to work. When she came back that evening, they had neighbor Giovanna Owings' son watch their boys. Tell me everything you guys did that night. What you guys talked about, what you argued, you're sitting here thinking, we didn't, I know you're we thinking. Didn't, uh, we didn't, we weren't arguing. Uh, we, we had a babysitter. I think her son Alex was babysitting. And I can't remember what, can't even remember what we were doing with the babysitter there. Okay. <clears throat> so you don't remember what you guys did from 6 o'clock till you went to bed on Saturday night? I just don't remember what activity we were doing. It's very unlikely he couldn't remember. They'd attended a company Christmas party for Josh's work, Aspen Logistics. Ellis moved on, asking about Sunday. Josh told the same story he had the night before, with some subtle differences. He said Susan had gone to church with the boys while he stayed home. Around noon, he went to the grocery store, then he came back and made lunch. Um, so I made an omelet and some kind of pancakes and I put cream cheese in them. I think that was all. Oh, and then she called Giovanna. Um, Anyway, Giovanna came over. Mm -hmm. She had some pancakes, too. Josh again described Susan getting sleepy and taking a nap, Giovanna going home, Susan waking up to eat hot dogs, and then Josh taking Charlie to go sledding. And I was talking to my son about s'mores. He was just super excited about cocoa and s'mores. (laughs) There's snow. Gotta eat cocoa. It's Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then we watched a movie. Well, no, actually, then we... Um, no, she wanted the couch cleaned, so I did the rug doctor. We try to do something each week, you know. Um, it's too hard if it's all wet at once, you know, and it dries slow. So we... Um, then we watched a movie, and I think that was probably Santa Claus 3. 
Um, And then we uh, finish up the movie. I talked to her about, uh, about taking the boys to do s'mores and to try out the new generator, you know. Mm -hmm. And she went to bed. And I finished packing and loaded them up. Ellis wanted to know, had Susan raised a stink about Josh leaving in the middle of the night on a Sunday with a blizzard bearing down with the boys in their only car when they both had to work the next morning? Did you make arrangements? Uh, did you guys uh, talk about arrangements for her getting to work? I was thinking it was going to be Sunday and I didn't even think about work. And her? I guess it didn't cross her mind at the time. Okay. And then what time, what time did you say that she went to bed? Probably 12.30ish. Okay. Was there anything said before she went to bed? Any you guys talk about anything else before she went to sleep? Just hugged and say goodnight. That's about it. Ellis asked Josh what he'd packed in the minivan. Josh said the generator, heater, humidifier, extra clothing, camping supplies, and a bunch of other stuff. And what's the bunch of this other stuff? I don't know. I mean, oh, come on, Josh. You remember putting <laughs> cream cheese in a pancake, and you tell me you can't remember what you put in your car? I mean, that's basically all the significant stuff. Josh said he'd left the house with the boys sometime around 1.30 or 2 a.m., driving directly out to the Pony Express Trail. He had a full tank of gas and made no stops or detours. But it was also snowing, and so it, I was pretty focused on the road. Okay. I'm looking for a turn off. Like I say, I just found a trail and... Were you concerned with the snow, knowing that there was a snowstorm coming in? Um, yeah, I was... In a minivan? Actually, the minivan handles like a 4x4. Four four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you can go some serious off-roading with that minivan. Okay. So, I mean, wasn't that a concern with the, the storm coming in and it was already snowing? It wasn't already snowing when I left. No, it was snowing when you got out it there. It was, yeah. And so I was watching the road and I'm going, how thick is this going to get? Mm -hmm. And, you know, are we going to get stuck? <coughs> and then I thought, well, you know, what are the odds that it'll be anything that'll get us stuck out there, mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, and we have the generator and the heaters, and so it's like, well, it's, we can risk it. Yeah. Already here, what the heck, you know? Okay. So about how far do you think you went west on the trail? If you had a guess. I don't know. Maybe 20 miles or who knows. Okay. So maybe 20 miles. It was the same vague answer he'd given on Monday night. Josh had Ellis at a disadvantage here. The detective, he didn't know the geography. Honestly, I've got to be honest with you, I've never been out there. I need to make sure. I haven't been out there too long. I haven't been out there, so it's a nasty I don't road. Know if, okay, but so I don't know if there's like any landmarks, if there's camping there's grounds not. all along the road. Um, if there's. So. In fact, there's only one formal campground along the old Pony Express route in Utah's West Desert. It's at Simpson Springs. Most of the land along the trail is public and open to primitive camping, meaning people can set up wherever they want for free. That's Josh's kind of trip. And it's exactly what he said he did. He claimed to have reached his campsite sometime around 4 a.m. on Monday. Now, that timeline does work. I personally retraced the route he described, 
by driving it myself in early December of 2017. You can read about that trip at thecoldpodcast.com. Considering the time needed to set up the generator, heaters, and humidifier, Josh wouldn't have made it to sleep until about 4.30 a.m. He told Ellis he'd come awake with the sunrise, even though the sun was obscured by the storm, at about 7 a.m. That would have been a very short night of sleep. After waking, Josh said he made a campfire and roasted marshmallows. He and the boys kicked around their campsite for a couple of hours, then drove aimlessly along various dirt trails. Around noon, he turned for home. Or just I washed wash the car out. <coughs> just, uh, just the first car wash I saw. Where's that at? In, I guess it's in Lehigh. What road were you on? Couldn't tell you. That one that comes through Lehigh. Okay. What, uh, what was the car wash like? What kind of a car wash was it? Um, well, it was a self-serve. Self-serve? Yeah. Okay. What was the name of it? I have no clue. How did you pay for the services? Okay. What was So when you say self-serve, is that um, describe what it looks like? Just garages that you can pull into and wash. Okay. You just get your pressure washer. No attendant that's know. there, no gas station. Okay. No, there. How many bays are there? I don't even know. There's, there's a handful. What side of the road's it on? North. And on and on it went. I wanted to know if Josh might have made up this car wash, so I kept an eye out for it during my reenactment trip. There are two car washes on the north side of Lehigh's Main Street between Redwood Road and I-15. One is attached to a gas station, so that wasn't the right one. The other has four self-serve bays, just as Josh described. Cell service was, and still is, spotty to non-existent in the West Desert. But I checked my phone at the car wash. It had full bars. Josh hadn't bothered to turn on his phone while he was there. Do you have any voicemails on your phone from her? I'm sure she was probably um, concerned for you, know you what? and the boys. I was making calls this morning and I didn't realize, I guess my phone has been just bugging out. So. What do you mean? Um... It just cuts out and okay. and dies, you know? Okay. But so, that doesn't stop your voicemail. This was getting ridiculous. When Ellis asked Josh where officers ought to look for Susan, he suggested beauty supply stores. Then he added something he'd not said on Monday night. He told Ellis Susan had been suicidal. How did that affect your guys' relationship? We start seeing a counselor. Oh, and she was depressed that I wasn't going to church. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, um, things have been going good, you know? I should point out here that in all of the materials of Susan's I've read, her emails, her adult journal, I've not seen anything that would corroborate the claim she was suicidal. Ellis decided it was time for a break. He'd been talking to Josh for nearly three hours. He stepped out of the room to check with the rest of his team. Another detective, Tony Martell, came in to keep Josh from leaving. Well, tell me how you're feeling right now. Just see if I can help you out. What's going on? Um, I mean, let me help you out, man. Okay? Seriously. <sighs> Um, honestly kind of confused and distracted, and pre pretty worried. Yeah. What are you worried about? 
I just don't think she would. I don't care. Um, I'm just worried about what the possibilities are, you know? And I'm, I'm not getting more encouraged over time. Right. And I mean, there's obviously a little bit of worry about, you know, what, you know, what's going to happen to me or my boys, you know? But right. What can I do to help you with that? I I don't know. And then this one here. Just well, have to take it one one day at a time. Right. Martell didn't buy it. Here's Ellis Maxwell. Yeah, he he was taking advantage of. You know, a new person being in the room. He was, he was taking that opportunity to, yeah, literally put on an act, saying, "Oh, you know, my wife," and which was all nonsense. At the end of the day, is what he's doing is he's trying to take advantage of the detective. What he didn't know is the detective had already watched and had been monitoring right the entire time. I mean, we're not dumb, and uh, you know, so it wasn't going to go anywhere. Josh kept up the emotion. Are you um, a grief counselor or something? No, I'm a detective for West Valley. I am. You know, it's just uh, come in here and just uh, say hi while he's on the phone so you're not here by yourself wondering what's going on. Well, I appreciate it because every time I sit in here by myself, I just want to leave. Yeah, I don't want you to do that because we've got to get you know, figure out what can help you, you know. When Ellis returned, Josh switched back to the blank, emotionless stare. I need you to tell me what you think has happened to her. I don't think she would leave on her own. Okay. That's a start. You don't think she would leave on her own. What do you what do you think has happened? <clears throat> I just don't know. I mean you know you can sit and speculate, but I don't have any clue. Okay. What do you think I'm speculating? I I don't know. Well, something must have crossed your mind for you to say that to well, me. You guys, you know, I mean, it's a fact, you know. The closest people to a person is always the top suspects. So. Okay, they're not suspects. I mean, you have to, I mean, there has to be some type of involvement to be a suspect. I mean, uh, maybe, I mean, so it's not always like that. So Josh clearly understood the cloud of suspicion that surrounded him and the risk he had taken showing up at the police station. Ellis reassured him he was not under arrest, but at the same time, he needed to turn their conversation into an interrogation. Obviously, I felt he was responsible. It's very clear that he's responsible. And the last thing I wanted to do is to get some information and then later be in court, right? And it'd be all redacted because, you know, now I, I illegally obtained this information and I violated his civil rights. He needed to ask why Josh had had Susan's cell phone in the minivan and why its SIM card was missing. And we need to get this figured out. I have other questions. I have a couple of other questions that I want to ask you, okay? okay. Um, and in order for me to ask you these questions and then ask you to do something else, I have to read you your Miranda rights. Okay. Why? The reason why is because it's a... What, is, what does this mean, read me my... Okay, well, let me explain to you. Okay, let me explain to you. That's probably one of the most challenging things in police work and in investigative work is when you have a suspect or a person of interest and you're interviewing them on moving into an interrogation, you've got to read them the rights, right? And you've got to do that in a fashion that 
you want them to talk to you still. You're not under arrest. You're not going to jail. Okay. okay. I'm not going to cuff you up. All right. And like I said, again, you're not under arrest. You came here on your free will. You could leave at any time. You already knew that. You still know that, right? Although I want to ask you more specific questions, and um, and I want to see if, if you say that you're willing to help us out, then what do we need to do? We need to eliminate you as being a person of interest. There's nobody else out there for me to go and talk to and to clarify. So I need to clarify your story. I need to verify guess, your story, right? I guess at that point, then I need to... So I need to verify. I probably need to consider. So I need lawyers. to verify. Okay. Well, and if that's the case, then that just is going to prolong the. Um, well, whatever. I, I'm just. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read your rights. Well, I told okay. you everything okay. that I know. Josh would not crack. The time had come for Ellis to make a gambit. I'm going to read you your rights. Okay. We have your we have your house. You're not going to be able to go back to your house. Okay. What do you mean? I'm We're housed. Your house is ours for right now. We're not going to let you back into that house. Okay. Your car is ours. We're not going to let you have your car. Okay. We need to find her, right? Yeah. Isn't that what your goal is? I would hope that our goals is the same. The look on his, on his face was great, and the feeling was wonderful for me, and I was very hopeful that we would find something in his van or inside the home that would support that he was responsible. Ellis read Josh's rights, not once, but twice, and asked if he still wanted to talk. Josh wouldn't give a straight answer. I don't know no. if I'm ready to do that. It's yes or no. Say yes or no. You want to have a minute to think about it? No, I was... You know, I was already a little bit concerned. Well, I'm concerned <laughs> about your wife not being around. So, let me step out for a second. I'll come back and grab you. Okay? But grab me for what? Well, if you don't want to talk... Then what? Then I guess you're going to leave. Okay. I mean, you could leave any time anyways. Josh stood. A look of relief on his face. I, yeah, I mean, let me think about it for a couple days, and <laughs> your wife is missing, Josh. Yeah, but I. And you want to think else. about it for a couple of days? Ellis left the room, just as Josh was about to follow. Detective Martell appeared again. He coaxed Josh back into his seat. There were no sniffles this time. When I go out, that's when I learned that. Uh, you know, we have the children, and we've got them at the Children's Justice Center, and uh, another detective had done a, a fabulous job uh, doing a forensic interview as best as she could. Remember, Josh had left Charlie and Braden with his mom and sister. In her brother's absence, Jennifer had tried to prove to the police her loyalty was to Susan and to the truth. So... I just told them, I tried, I tried to, you know, off, off to the side where my mom couldn't hear her so much. You know, I tried, I just, I told them, hey, look, this isn't a good situation. I think that there's something going on here and I don't know exactly, but I'm, I'm willing to help. Whatever you need, whatever you need me to do, I'm willing to help. The police asked Jennifer to take the boys to the South Valley Children's Justice Center. So she did. Charlie was four, going on five, so not the most reliable witness. You know, you can't put a lot of credit into kids', uh, children's sense of time at that age. Still, he said enough. Charlie said mommy had gone camping with them, but stayed in the place with the shiny rocks and pretty flowers. To Ellis, that sounded a lot like the West Desert. So... It's some information. Is it, is it the information we need that's going to get us what we want? No. But I, I take advantage of it. I take it, and I go back in. Josh was making a move for the door when Ellis reappeared. Well, have a seat. You might want to sit down for this one. Okay. <clears throat> um, I 
just spoke with some of sorry, this chair screwed up. I just spoke with some of our other detectives. Um, and you're gonna have to wait here with us. You're not gonna go anywhere. Um, one of our detectives just uh, interviewed your children. And uh, your children are telling our detectives that uh, mom went with you guys last night and that she didn't come back. She did not go with us. Okay, well, with that, just getting that information, you're not gonna go anywhere. I'm not gonna let you leave. I'm gonna detain you, you sit right here. If you want a lawyer and you wanna talk or you wanna change your mind and talk or take a CBSA test, um, then we can do those things, but. <clears throat> with that in mind. They know that she didn't go with us. Ellis admitted to me that he had entered dangerous territory here. I told him we wasn't going to leave and, you know, maybe violated his rights for 10 seconds, but it was frustrating. You know, I'd never in my career experienced uh, an individual like that before. Josh was literally and figuratively in a corner under the withering stares of two detectives who obviously believed he was responsible for his wife's disappearance. Suddenly, every assurance he had received that he could leave whenever he wanted evaporated. Let's go back to the right so You're not leaving either way. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to have you answer some questions for us. Because you can't leave either way. But what I want you to be aware of is, do you have rights? Okay? And it would probably be to your best interest to listen to this rights. Well, he's going to read okay, to you. but I do want the lawyer because at this point I definitely want a lawyer. Okay. So where is where do I get the lawyer? In fact, Ellis took Josh's phone. Then he and Detective Martell left the room. They were gone for three full minutes. During that time, Josh sat perfectly still, his ankles crossed, his head high, his fingers interlaced. He didn't cry. He didn't fidget. Ellis couldn't believe it. I don't think I was frustrated to the point that I botched the interview. I'm not the greatest detective that's out there by no means. However, I think I have a, a, a pretty good skill set and the ability to read individuals and get them to speak with me. Josh and... Uh, his type, you know, these sociopaths, are an exception. If Josh wasn't going to talk, Ellis needed something else. There has to be some sort of physical evidence or forensic evidence that's going to support whatever criminal charges. Short of that, he had to let Josh walk. Okay, so before I call, I just want to make sure, do, um, if I call an attorney... You want to talk more? Um, <clears throat> or no? Honestly, I'm already feeling sick. I I wanted to go a long time ago, and at this point, I'm okay. If you want to leave, you can leave. I can leave? Yeah, if you want to leave, you can leave. Okay. Now, and you're keeping my phone? Or? I'm going to keep your phone. After nearly four hours, the interview ended. Listening to the recording now, it's hard to understand why Ellis let Josh leave. I asked him to explain his thinking in that moment. You know, it's all kind of circumstantial, right? You can't tie it to a specific crime. You can't say that Josh is responsible for her disappearance based off of any of that. Because we don't have any witnesses, we have no confession, and we have no body. To use a chess analogy, he had put Josh in check, one move away from game over. 
But Josh kept moving his pieces just enough to stay out of checkmate. The police needed to trap Josh. The rest of the major crimes team had been at work drafting warrants while Josh and Ellis were talking. You know, there was enough evidence there that, and, and suspicion, right, reasonable suspicion, that we could secure these just based off of, you know, his lack of statements, his story, you know, Susan not having any criminal history, no, no past of running off and abandoning her family. So you got a lot of stuff like that that can support the reasonable suspicion, but you don't have the probable cause to put the guy into jail. Two detectives had also gone to Susan's work that afternoon. Now, during both of Josh's interviews with police, he mentioned a co-worker of Susan's named Linda. The two detectives who went to Wells Fargo Investments wanted to find Linda. But Linda Bagley wasn't there. It was her day off. Tuesday I had off, and my other co-worker sent me a, a message saying, have you seen Susan or talked to Susan? And I said, no. And she says she's missing. Linda's mind raced. She thought about all of their conversations, all of Susan's frustration with her marriage and talk of divorce, how she had said, if something ever happens to me, make sure they look at Josh. Linda knew Susan kept a set of secret personal files in her desk drawer. And I told my coworker to make sure she gave this information file folder to the police. So I wasn't there. I'd seen it like in my drawer, though, a week or two beforehand and thought, oh, yeah, I remember Susan told me about this folder. And, uh, and then she disappeared, so... The detectives found the documents, including a journal, a typed description of a trip Susan had taken with Josh and the boys to Simpson Springs the prior May, notes about divorce attorneys and significant fights with Josh, as well as copies of emails in which she described extreme unhappiness with the state of her marriage. The detectives also checked in with the Wells Fargo security team. They confirmed Susan's badge hadn't been scanned since she left the building at the end of her shift the afternoon of Saturday, December 5th. Security cameras had recorded her walking out to the garage and driving away in the family's minivan. Back at the station, Detective David Greco finished writing a search warrant for the house in a minivan. He explained a need for police to seize property, including at least two computers officers had seen at the house on Monday. The warrant made clear they expected to find evidence of crimes, possibly including obstruction of justice, unlawful detention, kidnapping, and murder. Josh left the interrogation room at about 4.15 on Tuesday afternoon. While he was technically free to leave, he had no car and no phone with which to call for a ride. Ellis had assured him he could have the van back that night once he finished searching it. And we wanted him to stick around. I mean, obviously, we want him to stick around and get back in this minivan, and we want to see where he goes, right? Hopefully he returns to the location wherever he disposed of her. But it was going to take some time. The judge didn't sign the warrants until about 7 p.m. Ellis led the search of the minivan. First, he had a forensic expert scan the tailgate, cargo area, and front seats for blood. He found nothing. A cadaver dog also sniffed the minivan, but didn't show any interest. The inside of the van looked very different than it had the night before. All of the clutter was gone. The camping supplies, the tools, the generator, and the rest had all been removed. Ellis found a camera, a flash drive, and a white plastic trash bag sitting in the open. The garbage bag appeared to have come from the kitchen of the house. It held all the slimy refuse one might expect. Banana peels, orange rinds, and fast food wrappers. Of more interest were a pancake, a breakfast pastry, a used paper plate, and an empty container of orange juice concentrate. Now, these were presumably from the lunch Josh had prepared on Sunday, just before Susan started feeling drowsy. So clearly we took it. We analyzed everything out of there. It was a theory that he poisoned or sedated Susan. You know, whether if it was 
with prescription medication or whatever, but we felt that he likely put something in her food because he cooked her some food, you know, that Sunday. Tests on the garbage would later come back negative for any drugs. Still, it seemed odd for Josh to have put the kitchen trash in the minivan. Both of his garbage cans outside of the residence were empty. So he could have easily thrown that garbage sack in the garbage cans at his residence, but he chose not to. He chose to put it in his van and he was going to dispose of it elsewhere. I don't think he expected us to take custody of his van. Ellis found something else in the van too, another trash bag hidden behind the driver's seat. In the floorboard, there's a storage space. And when you open that, there is another garbage sack and it contains several pieces of heavily burnt drywall, sheetrock, whatever you want to call it. And if you put it all together, you can see that, because it was broken, right? So it's in several pieces. You can see that uh, he had sheetrock piled so he had a few pieces on top and then, and he put some sort of an object on there and destroyed it with some heavy heat. Ellis couldn't make any sense of the burned object. Whatever it had been, it was beyond recognition. He did have an acetylene torch in the garage. So it's very likely that he used that torch to destroy whatever this item was. And this item was also in there as well, but it was just like a just a black, hard, almost like a rock, about the size of your palm. And, you know, there was a couple of wires as well. West Valley eventually sent the item to a special FBI lab, but tests were inconclusive. They showed it was mostly steel, which would seem to rule out small electronics like a cell phone, GPS unit, or hard drive. To this day, Ellis can't say what that object was. Meanwhile, at the house, a team of seven detectives paid special attention to the area where the two fans had been pointed in the living room. They wanted to know if Josh had used his rug doctor to clean blood from the couch or carpet. Forensic specialists applied a product called Blue Star on and around the couch. Blue Star can help reveal the presence of blood by reacting with hemoglobin, the iron-rich protein in blood that carries oxygen throughout the body. A series of small spots on the tile floor between the couch and the front door started to glow blue. A clear indication. That's not something that was obvious when you first entered the residence. It wasn't a significant amount of blood. These spots were very small. This blood is just tiny, like it's probably even smaller than the end of a ballpoint pen. And they just, they look like little droplets on the tile that's adjacent to the carpet and the couch. Ellis told me it wasn't as if somebody had been shot or stabbed. This is how I interpret it when I saw it. I would describe it as if you were to lean over to your left and cough or sneeze and you had some sort of blood, you know, in your nasal cavity or in your throat or mouth, that's what I would compare it to. The forensic team swabbed the spots, collecting samples to be used for DNA analysis. It would later prove to be Susan's blood. The Blue Star also revealed a small blood swipe mark on the upper headrest of the couch, about where your shoulder would be when sitting down. Again, it wasn't a lot of blood, but it did turn out to be Susan's. You know, that's our evidence. <laughs> you know, we have a, a heavily destroyed object that we can't identify. We have a sack full of garbage that we can't find any clues as to why he would want to dispose of it elsewhere other than his own garbage can. And we have some minor tiny blood droplets in the front room and a blood swipe, a small blood swipe on the couch. And that's it. They tried Blue Star on the circular saw and plastic sled that had been in the minivan the night before. Neither reacted. The Scooby-Doo onesie and most of the blankets that had been in the minivan on Monday night were sitting in a laundry basket in the master bedroom. They appeared to have been cleaned. In the bedroom closet, the detectives found a letter to Susan from Josh's dad, Steve. Dear Susan, happy birthday. Sorry it's so late. 
And the little sack is a necklace I thought would look nice with a casual outfit. If you don't like it, don't make a special trip to return it since it wasn't that expensive. Susan had kept that necklace, but reluctantly. In an email just shy of a month before she disappeared, she asked a coworker how she looked that day. The necklace I'm unsure of. The wicked father-in-law mailed it to me. Also in the closet, the detective spied a small notebook in Susan's handwriting. It contained 26 pages written in one sitting. It was the letter Susan had written to Josh about a year earlier while praying for guidance about her marriage at a temple. It seemed damning from the very first page. I am not threatening divorce, but what you ask of me is too great to bear. You must understand that my religion is a part of me. You can't ask me to pick and choose only certain parts of it to live and expect me to be happy. Detectives grabbed Susan's purse from the bedroom dresser. In it, they found her driver's license, her checkbook, her credit and debit cards, various store cards and receipts, a temple recommend for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, photos, and a pocket calendar. There were several events marked on the calendar for days that very week. They included a potluck dinner, a church choir practice, and a concert Susan had planned to attend with Josh's sister, Jennifer. She'd even made elaborate plans to overdress for her work's black tie Christmas party on December 10th. It was supposed to be a big joke because she and a coworker had gotten into trouble for showing up in jeans the year prior. She wrote this about it in an email. So I'm wearing an old formal this year. It's maroon, velvet, Rose pattern on black. I'm trying to get a hold of a child's dress-up crown, and I'll do my hair in an updo to continue the overstatement. Dark smoky eyes and any other big shiny jewelry I can get my hands on. I'm way excited. These were not the plans of a woman who intended to disappear. The detectives took the rug doctor and the bag from the Kirby vacuum cleaner, both of which were still sitting in the master bedroom. From the living room, they took the entire couch, a white yarn blanket, and they even cut up a big patch of the carpet. In the laundry room, they found eight clean washcloths, which the day before had been soggy, sitting wet in the bathtub. In the garage, they found some, but not all, of what had been in the minivan on Monday night. Two blue tarps, one of them muddy, the shovel, the broom, and the rake. Inexplicably, they left behind much more including the generator, gas can, sleds, camping supplies, and hand tools. They took five computers out of the house, along with seven hard drives or thumb drives. They didn't realize it then, but Josh's digital devices were going to become a key part of their investigation. Remember, Ellis even wrapped their second interview by taking Josh's cell phone. Oh, come on. You said you were going to give me the phone. Mm. I need, to, I need to, what we'll do is we'll hang on we're going to hang on to it for evidence at this point. Yeah. Okay? We're going to keep it. And it's going to be part of the case. Investigators hoped to pull information from the phone's SIM card, but Josh had anticipated the move. While sitting in the interrogation room, he had managed to surreptitiously slip the SIM card out of the phone before Ellis could take it. Modern smartphones rely almost exclusively on internal storage or removable memory, like SD cards, to hold information. Older cell phones came with little onboard storage. Instead, they often saved stuff like uh, text messages, call histories, or cellular network tower information on their SIM cards. In 2009, GPS functionality was just finding its way into smartphones. Budget phones, like the one Josh owned, didn't include GPS receivers, meaning they couldn't self-locate. Police could only determine cell phone locations if they knew which towers a particular device had contacted. Josh understood all of this. By removing his SIM card, he was trying to block the police from seeing where he'd been or whom he'd called. Detective Daryl Dane immediately sent a letter to T-Mobile, Josh's cell phone provider, asking the company to send over records as evidence of a possible crime. That crime, according to the letter, was aggravated murder. The records did confirm Josh's claim he'd called his dad at about a quarter afternoon on Sunday. 
after that, his handset went dark. It didn't connect to any towers until just after 3 p.m. on Monday when Giovanna's son Alex called him. It's interesting because he takes that phone call for whatever reason. I, I don't know if he accidentally answered it. Maybe he doesn't have Giovanna's number. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why he answered, but he answered it, and uh, he's in West Valley. Think about that. Josh was in West Valley at 3 p.m., just a few blocks north of home near the city's family fitness center. But he told Giovanna he was down south, just off the Pony Express trail. After speaking with Giovanna and learning police were waiting at the house, Josh turned around and left West Valley. A half hour later, he dialed his voicemail and retrieved his messages. Two minutes after that, he called Susan's phone, the one that was right next to him, in the van's center console. Hello, Susan. We are on our way back, and um, I can't believe that somehow my brain missed the day. I thought today was Sunday. Um, that was really, really stupid. But um, anyway, hopefully you got to work okay. And um, of course, give me a call. We're, I guess, planning on picking you up. But let me know because um, if you have plans afterwards or whatever. So, anyway, we ran into every conceivable problem, and anyway, it was kind of a nightmare, but, oh well, I mean, there was some fun aspects. All right, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Both of those outgoing calls went through cell towers near Point of the Mountain. That's about 20 miles south of West Valley City. Now, Point of the Mountain is back the direction Josh said he had come after leaving the Pony Express Trail. He had intentionally gone out of his way to backtrack before leaving that message on Susan's voicemail. To Ellis, that's a clear sign Josh realized he'd made a mistake. Because he did slip up right there, right? You know, those, those, that voicemail, checking it, and making the phone calls should have been done when he passed through that area. But his phone was off. His phone was off, so we couldn't track him. We couldn't ping his phone. We couldn't see where his location was. Josh's sister Jennifer believes he was trying to build an alibi. He's attempting to paint a picture, but the picture is turning out really badly. Yeah. Ellis said he believed Giovanna's son had unwittingly ruined Josh's plan. Next, Josh drove north, past West Valley to Salt Lake City. The phone records show he went to Susan's work, where he left her another voicemail. Hello. I'm out here, so I'm... Wait for you. So anyway, I'm um, in front. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye. In neither police interview did Josh describe his movements quite that way. The cell tower records proved Josh lied. When you look at those facts and you and you see his movements and his actions and his behavior, uh, he had a, a tentative plan, and we foiled it. And because of his personality, he can't deviate too far off of his plan, right? So he follows through with it because he has no option, no other options. He didn't, he didn't plan for a plan B or a C. Unfortunately, Ellis had no way of knowing any of this on the night of December 8th. Josh just kept waiting in the lobby of the West Valley Police Station as the detectives performed their searches. A couple of patrol officers gave him a lift across the street to the Valley Fair Mall so he could buy some dinner. Then they drove him back. Jennifer waited as well. I thought he was going to come back that night after the uh, interview that he had with, that, with the police on Tuesday morning. And so I just continued to expect a phone call, letting us know that he was coming or just him showing up. Honestly, I was dreading it. I really didn't want him to come back and take the boys. I wanted the boys to stay here with us and and felt like that was the safest place for them. But time just drug on and it, it was kind of a nightmare of, a, of an evening. Josh didn't have a cell phone anymore, but there was a phone in the lobby of the police station. He didn't use it. Police staff reassured him, saying they'd release his minivan soon. Just wait a little bit longer. 
The judge had given police permission to hide a GPS tracking beacon on the minivan, which they did. Ellis had set a trap. He was hoping Josh would fall for it and, in a panic, lead him right to Susan. Unfortunately, we didn't get that opportunity. You know, once again, he doesn't cooperate, (laughs) uh, which he never did. Ellis walked into the lobby with Josh's keys at about 9.40 p.m. I go to release the vehicle, and he's gone, and... Patrol officers don't know where he left and went to. He didn't say anything. He just up and left. He'd missed Josh by only about 10 minutes. No one could say where Josh had gone. He was, as they say, in the wind. On the next episode of Cold. Is he a suspect? No, he is not a suspect. Is he a person of interest? We have many people we are interested in. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Cold. Toss us a rating or a review. You can find Cold on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Cold Podcast. For video clips, pictures from the case, and more, hit up thecoldpodcast.com. Also, if Susan's story sounds familiar in your own life, In other words, if you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse in any form, please get immediate help. In the U.S., support is a phone call away at the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or online at www.thehotline.org. A quick thank you to my team, Kristen Sorensen, Eric Openshaw, Ken Fall, Danielle Prager, Adam Mason, Jillian Friedman, and especially Cheryl Worsley for all of their help with this project. The music for Cold was composed by Michael Bonmiller, except for the guitar stuff. That was me. Cold is a KSL podcast. Thank you for listening.